you, Professor Barash. Uh, my distinct pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm also happy to say that I'm a top parent. Uh, my son uh, is in the audience. Uh, he's also a third year uh, undergrad in the UC department. So it's really a pleasure. And I, I know Professor Barash for many years when uh, I did temporary research. We have done a lot of collaboration. I work with Professor Barash's students also. Some of them are my colleagues. Um, so today, uh, I'll be talking uh, mostly on the SDN and FE and a little bit of 5G, um, how, what we're doing within at and uh, what's happening across the industry, uh, including university and uh, some kind of an ecosystem, uh, what operators are doing, because I personally work in the security organization, but I'm also very active in the standards. Um, so I'll, I know we have a mixed audience here, I you know, like to you have a high level and a little bit more deep, and I have some use cases as well. Um, so, so I'll first uh, talk about some of the drivers, you know, what is virtualization, some of you may not know, why we are going uh, to virtualization, right, and virtualization and network function virtualization, so, and Professor Prash said like SDN, software defined network, so they kind of go hand in hand, um, you, SDN is an enabler for the network function virtualization in some way, right? So they kind of complement each other. That's why I say SD and SLAS and FD. And we'll give some example of that. Then um, the operators, when they're moving into virtualization, uh, that is security aspect. Uh, so virtualization has its own merits, right? Uh, and we'll see how it's scalable, simple, flexible, things like that. At the same time, when we have to think about security, uh, you should not forget that, right? When you're deploying a network, you need to know uh, make sure what are the potential targets, uh, potential attack points, uh, because as an operator we have to do that. I know in campus uh, environment, your IT department, they also have security, right? Um, so when you move to virtualization, the, there are challenges, but there are also opportunities. We can talk about that. Uh, some of the threat scenarios, then I will have some use cases because it's, it's good to show some illustration to understand um, where and how you benefit from the opportunity and where and how the additional challenges. Uh, then I'll briefly talk about standards activities and a little bit of testing because I know I work at Columbia, uh, I know how it, important it is for the student community to get involved. And when we hire people from different universities, we like to see people have some hands and experience. So it is very important to get, uh, while well, you know the protocols and uh, standards, you need to implement that, right? So, if you look at the kinds of application that's uh, evolving today, uh, I just give an example of some of those, and many of you have been utilizing those, right? You know, when you walk in the campus, uh, looking around, people have been you know, using different social networking, um, big data, uh, internet of things, right? Uh, connected cards. So there are, it's not email or file transfer uh, anymore, or just listening to streaming music or talking about my solar IP. Now, that has been the application of the past decade, right? We are moving ahead. And uh, there are sensors, uh, the massive data, right? So in order to support this kind of applications, you need to evolve your network as well. That means you have to build a network that is very flexible, dynamic in nature. You can program it very quickly on the fly, right? And there is a big demand of data and you have to make sure the new resources get deployed as quickly as possible. Right? So that's the driver. So so when you, when I say why people are moving into virtualization, in addition to the cost factor, this is another reason why operators are moving to virtualization. When I say virtualization, some of you may be wondering what is it. So I, I'll give an example, but mostly you have the traditional routers, switches, hardware based, they're all becoming like software based. Right. Um, this slide shows, uh, I'm trying to link this little bit, uh, SDN NFD with 5G. So 5G, uh, some of you who don't know, so there has been an evolution of cellular. 5G is not only cellular, right? it's more than cellular, right? So we have 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G. Now we have 4 LTE, which most of us are using is 4G. But that's more like a cellular technology, right? Now we are taking a you know, leapfrog thing to 5G, which is not only an evolution of 4G in terms of uh, your access speed, it also adds a lot of other network characteristics, and some of those I have listed here. 
uh, things like MASI MIMO, which are more like access centric. Uh, you can have multiple type of radio access, accessing the code. Uh, and we have device to device communication. Uh, then you can have massive, uh, you know, dense networks. Uh, context of networking, depending on where you are, how things um, you know, react to that. Uh, things I have highlighted <coughs> are the ones which map to SDN NAP. So what I'm trying to say when operators are doing SDN NAP network, 5G is going to build up on that, right? So, but 5G is more than SDN NAP. That's the point I'm making. So it is a SDN NAP is a subset of 5G, right? So these are the characteristics of 5G. But these are the ones uh, which will achieve when you implement SDN NAP. So that's what operators are not trying to gradually give off, right? Some point by 2020, we'll have a hopefully we'll have a 5G networks all deployed. But what we're doing now is going you know, on top of that. So today's talk is mostly on SDN and NAP and the focus on security. Right? So I'm trying to make a connection here. So this is um, another thing you might be wondering. Uh, I talked about various applications. And here I'm talking about what are the three different we call it hyperbole. And this specific one, uh, one of my colleagues uh, in the co-chair of the initiative along with me, there are pages from the University to see. There are three different axes. One is massive content, like broadband communication. You have like 10 gigabit, terabit per second, right? Uh, uh, traffic. Uh, the second uh, recordable is massive sensing. That means these are more like uh, IoT type of devices, right? They may be emitting a lot of traffic, and third one is the massive control. You need to have low latency. So, uh, you know, think, like, think about like a remote surgery. Uh, you'll be depending on a uh, network like 5G network where uh, it has to be real, real time, right? I mean, nowadays in voice over IP, you still have like 50 millisecond, 150 millisecond latency. If you have to support uh, application like remote surgery that have a stringent requirement, like quality of service, like one millisecond latency, you have to design a network completely different, right? So, so on the left side, I'm talking about some of the fundamental application that we have to support using 5G like NIM, mobile broadband, uh, critical communication, this interactive uh, industrial control, like robotics, IoT stuff, uh, machine type, uh, uh, network operation, which is more like in the core, how we want to make your network more flexible, right? Uh, we talk about network slicing a little bit, where uh, you have, let's say, one computer, you can, how to slice it, uh, make it like a multiple bunch of computers, uh, resources, right? Um, then vehicle to everything like vehicle to vehicle, connected cars, things like that, right? So those are some of the, again, um, uh, fundamental uh, uh, drivers, right, towards 5G. And if we have to support that, we have to build a network that is flexible enough, right? So this is kind of an example. Uh, if you see on the left-hand side, uh, the classic network appliance, where some of you might have seen even today in, in campuses, many of the um, universities, even in our network, uh, enterprise network, uh, they have hardware boxes like 3G. Uh, I remember I used to work for Columbia back in 89. Um, we used to have like Cisco routers, uh, switches. Uh, you want to change something, it takes a lot of time to configure those, uh, right? So, and on the, on the left side, I'm showing some of those. You have the firewall, uh, the routers, uh, 3G routers, uh, you know. Uh, Session for a controller, content distribution network, message router. So these are the kinds, and there are companies like Cisco, Juniper, uh, Huawei, right? There are different kinds of companies that build their own routers, and they, they run their own operating system. And sometimes they don't even operate, even they're supposed to be right? Uh, and, and, and system administrators, they have to learn each of their operating systems. Cisco for iOS, you have to learn that. So we're moving away from that. And going to a, this virtualized thing where you have a standard uh, common of the cell hardware, you can buy HP or Dell, um, then put your Linux, many of you must have done that, uh, Linux operating system. On the top of that, you run multiple virtual machines, right? And uh, you have hyperdriver as a substrate uh, on, on your uh, upper host operating system, and that will manage multiple uh, uh, virtual machines, right? And each of them can run different uh, application. So, 
So here you have an orchestrator, right? Uh, so you are basically moving away from a monolithic, uh, tightly coupled uh, uh, equipment that dependent on uh, proprietary systems uh, of, of the vendors uh, to a standard approach, right? Uh, and then you can build your own company, for example, startup company, and write your own software, routing software, or switching software, and um, just you know sell it to anybody. So you don't have to depend on the big vendors. I mean, even as we means. Operators do not have to, right? We can we write our own software. Uh, we can hire university uh, uh, you know, researchers to even write something for us, and we can collaborate. So things are becoming more and more flexible and easy to um, uh, implement and deploy, right? So this slide, so again, a little bit building up on that, how a network is to uh, look like traditional networking, like you have cabling. Obviously, you need some physical stuff. Uh, but you have network elements, service elements, and these are all tightly coupled, right? Um, okay. Control plane, power plane, data plane, they are all tightly coupled. Now we're moving away from that. This is a HDN uh, enabled uh, network, right? So I talked about this general purpose hardware. On the top of that, um, you build the hypervisor or virtual machines. Um, and then uh, some of these uh, equipment that you see here. Uh, uh, in, in case of like standard routers or switches, they are really supported using software, right? So it becomes like software programmable uh, network. Uh, it becomes software defined means you can, uh, uh, let's say you have a router, right? You want to configure that on the fly. Something is happening in the network. So you'd be able to program that router or switch on the fly and take action, right? Somebody attacking the network. See, nowadays we see a lot of hacks happening, right? How do we how do we do detect that and mitigate on the fly, right? Because we do that, something happens, then it takes like two, three hours before we figure out something happening. We want to stay away from that, right? The dying attack that happened three weeks back, uh, the whole network was down for maybe five, six hours before they realized. We want to stay away from that. And that is only possible uh, using your dynamic real time configuration, uh, detection, uh, you know, all software based stuff, right? Otherwise, you have to log in and figure out what happened and all those, right? Uh, so now I'm trying to show a difference between what is a traditional network and how it is different in the virtualized network. Um, so when we move away, uh, what are the advantages? So this is a network of the future, which is just think about virtualized, then finally it will be 5G, right? So obviously it's going to be faster. It's scalable because you can scale on demand. Um, it's dynamic. As I said, right, if there is a, there's a let's say you have a football stadium here, right, there's a, all of a sudden a lot of people uh, came to see a game and your cell tower becomes overly populated and people cannot even call, right? So at that point, you should, should have a mechanism to scale your network on demand, right? Like a stadium example. So that's called dynamic, you know, very network on demand. Uh, the load cost, you know, the cost is lower because you are depending on the standard common of the self hardware, like Dell or HP, and you're putting standard uh, operating system Linux or, or BSD or not, right? So you're not depending on a specific um, vendor product. So it's becoming low cost, low cost to maintain. You don't have to train people on different kinds of uh, vendor equipment. Uh, we talk about security, um, it's also accessible, right? You can access from anywhere, anytime. And security, we'll talk about that, of, you know, what are the advantages, what are the challenges. So that is the focus, right? So now you get to know what is virtualization, uh, what are the advantages of virtualization. Now we're going deep into security. So now I work for an operator at AT&T, uh, in the middle town. So what I'm showing here is, some of you might know, how when you are calling somebody, or you are you are at home, you have a DSL or cable modem, and you are communicating with the internet, right? Um, so how the packet goes? So you have, you have a home network, or you have a campus network like this, which is the access network, right? So this is the access. So you have, uh, this is the wireless access, you can have uh, 3G, 2G, or WiMAX, well, some people are still using it, LTE. Uh, you can have a wired access, like a DSL, VDSL, or, or cable modem, right? That's people are using today. And then you have some sort of a content distribution network, and finally, you get into the actual core network, which is 
your LTE core, like your packet core or IMS, if you are, want to support voice over IP, you have to use IMS, which is called Bolting Network, right? So when operator like AT&T or Verizon or Sprint or T-Mobile, um, they have you know, some form of this network today. And when, I, when we say virtualization, we are trying to virtualize each and every component. For example, AT&T, by 2020, we have a mandate for management, 70% of our network will be virtualized. Okay? So we have to start doing in a gradual fashion. At the same time, we have to coexist. So for example, what we have done so far, we have virtualized our uh, access network. We, we did that last year. Um, we have not virtualized the base station yet. That's, that's going to be probably the last one. But uh, we are still using our non-virtualized base station in the cell towers, you see. Uh, we virtualized our access. Now, for this year, we have a 35% of our Core network will be virtualized. So when I say we virtualize, today we are using, uh, you know, uh, MME or PGW, SW, these are all different components of the PC network from various vendors, like, you know, Nokia, Ericsson, things like that. Um, so if we are going to virtualize those, I will show you what that means. Uh, we might be using the software from them, but we are also getting stuff from Afar networks, for example, which is like a small startup. So you can build your own startup, and operators, for operator doesn't matter, right? As long as you maintain the protocols, we just buy the software and run it on our, uh, on our cost, right? So just like you build your own, let's say you want to build an operator network here in a university, it's pretty simple today. You can have your own, uh, you know, cell tower, micro cell, and you can call from one place to another place, right? I mean, I'm just giving it, because we have done that also in one of the tests where I show you. So this is how, you know, Companies, uh, they are gradually uh, virtualizing different components and finally everything will be end to end virtualization, right? And this is an example of some advantage. I mean, I, uh, so if you see here, uh, this is, these are different components like DNS, DSCP, uh, those are the standard, uh, you know what DNS, DSCP are, right? This is your IP address and this is for your domain name service. And these are other components which provide the people packet code, routing the packets, right? Uh, similarly, these are for uh, your uh, IMS service, right? Now, when I move them, uh, you know, let's say Google is data centers, I move them and put them in a the cloud. So virtualization is what we have been putting in the cloud. Uh, if some, let's say one of the component fails, right? So how quickly you can instantiate a new component without affecting the user, right? If I'm talking to somebody, or I'm doing the internet browsing, for some reason my uh, packet gateway, or PDN gateway, or service, service, service gateway get overloaded, how quickly I, uh, you know, provide, how quickly I instantiate a new service with the user doesn't know what is happening, right? Otherwise, it takes a lot of time. So you are, in the end, you're providing better quality of service by having a virtualized network. And we'll see how that happens. Um, similarly, you can have a forty uh, component. Uh, this is a SIP server. Uh, might have the same problem. You know, it could be overload. It could be somebody might be attacking, hacking it. Right. So you basically re relocate a virtual network function from one hardware to another hardware, to another VM to another VM. Okay. So this is how it looks like. So you might be wondering how a virtualized network looks like. Right. I mean, this is a very simple illustration of that. Um, so you can have different kinds of uh, end users. These are the you know, B. So see if you have uh, you know, connected cards. Uh, you can have uh, phones. You can have different web sensors. And then what you're seeing here is an example of how if you have to build a virtual EPC in, in your worker lab today, right? So you have a software-defined network. You have a common of the uh, cell, you know, hardware like HP or Cal. Yeah, you pick a hypervisor like Zen or whatnot, KVM, depends what you want. And then, if you see those components I was showing, you can have multiple of those MMEs, that's a mobility management entity. And all of this can stay in one box, you can have also multiple boxes, it doesn't matter, right? It can depend how you communicate. So, what has happened here, if you look at it, um, you have the ability, uh, if you write your own software with MME, SCW, PGW, I can just basically build an EPC in a box, and people have done that. 
So I, I can I can just build a Linux sort of a system and run. I call it like a, this is my network. Right? I can just do that, and it's pretty interesting to see that. You know, put them in a small compactor. This is my EPC. I just build a <laughs> operator network right here. Uh, but that is simple, just to build. But you need to manage that, right? So in order to manage, you have a management orchestration. You have a SDN controller that will help to. Uh, configure the routers on the pi, switches on the pi, and we'll see some examples of that. And on the top of that, you need um, monitoring, you know, who is coming, who is attacking my network. Uh, you need to be able to do analytics, right? Uh, you want to know, let's say, there is attack coming, how do I know who is attacking it? Uh, this is my data plane, this is my control plane, and user management, etc. right? So now, this is my uh, virtual EPC. And then I can connect to internet, I can connect to virtualized IMS. So what I'm showing here is, it's so easy to build this kind of thing. If you know the protocols, you know to how to write code, you can just build your own uh, virtual PC and just try it out. Right? And there are many places, the open source people are using it. I will give an example of how at and um, uh, another example, right? So I told you, right, we're doing it very gradually. So we started with uh, fixed access. Uh, network and demand we called it. Uh, this is an example of how, because I'm a security guy, uh, firewall, everybody knows that firewall is, right? You can filter, apply filters and uh, block the unwanted traffic. Let's say you want to block the DNS 53 block. You know, that's a very simple way of doing it. Um, I'll apply some access control based right, ACL stuff. So if you see here in this picture on the left side, so these are, uh, if by no means I'm telling we are using you know, we are using some of those, but I'm just giving random firewalls which are out there. Some of them are pretty well known firewall companies. And until like two, three years back, they all had this hardware based firewall. So you put it, bring it in the rack, and you configure something, you say, okay, uh, this goes to this destination, block it. This goes to this destination, only telnet will be blocked. FTP will be allowed. Things like that, right? Best on port numbers. Um, uh, so obviously, it is uh, difficult to manage. And the firewall becomes overloaded, I've seen some lines, and traffic has usually completely stops. So we are moving away. So we took uh, firewall as a first example in the security case and moved to a, we call it domain two, which is virtualized security. So we said, let's virtualize the virtual firewall. I mean, the firewall. So we call it virtual firewall. And if you see here the different colors, uh, it can be from different vendors. So virtual firewall one could be from Palo Alto, firewall two could be. Uh, from next out, uh, firewall three could be from Modi, for example, right? Because each of them have different functionality. Some of them could be DNS firewall, some could be um, application lab firewall, some could be SIP firewall, right? And they may not support, so they call it service chaining. So basically, you can uh, service chain then depending on what kind of attack is happening, okay? And then you have into the detection system. So if you see carefully here, I call it AIC cloud infrastructure, which is a combination of a commodity hardware plus some sort of a commodity operating system like Linux. On the top of, top of that, you can have OpenStack or you can have any standard KVM or Gen or even VMware if you want, right? Any, uh, any of those um, high provider, right? So once you have the basic uh, uh, infrastructure in place, uh, you install this DNS, virtual network functions, which are firewalls. Then, if you remember the previous slide I was talking, you still need some sort, some sort of an operational management framework. So that is what is called orchestrator. So you need to have an orchestrator that will, uh, while let's say this virtual firewall, okay, there are two things. Initially, you have to install it. So you need some way to install those things, right? So you have to install a VM. Uh, you have to install uh, an application, like either a firewall or IDS or IDS. Then you have to do the networking, right? So there are different controllers for doing each of those functions. And this, this guy, this orchestrator, is in, yeah, in, in, you know, in you know, the very beginning, it is in charge of doing that. Then, when something happens to the network, orchestrator's job also to instantiate or, or de-instantiate it, you know, multiple instances. So you can, I can add multiple firewalls. Once the attack is subsided, I can decommission the firewall, right? There is another example, uh, interesting cost factor here. Think about it, right? Um, so licensing. So we pay, even if we are not using, we let's say bought a firewall, it can support, let's say, 1,000 sites, 1,000 license, right? But we don't use that all the time. 
So we are trying to come to a operational model where uh, users less uh, licensing cost, right? So if I am not, I don't have enough traffic. I'm using one virtual firewall instance. I don't have to pay that much, right? If I'm using more on demand, so that way my operational cost is also reduced. Okay? So that's another uh, aspect of that. Uh, so, so I guess security is dynamically orchestrated. Um, yeah, you got that. It's all cloud based, right? We will see some examples of that. So now, um, I will. Um, yes, question. Um, so the virtual firewalls, where would they be running physically? Right. So, okay, let me go to the next slide. I'll show you a little bit. So, so virtual firewall, right, this is a whole packet course slide. Um, the virtual firewall, depending on the type of application, if you are trying to, um, you're trying to detect and mitigate a DNS queries, let's say, right? Um, you can put it in this case. I give an example. So let's say somebody is trying to do a DNS attack um, on my one of the DNS servers and it's coming from the internet. So ideally, I should put it somewhere at the entry point, right? Um, I can also put it somewhere. I don't saw the DNS server here. I can put it right in front of the DNS server, right? right. That's one example. Another example of if uh, so that is from the internet side, right? If this endpoint. And going to a, some uh, bad URL server and trying to download a malware document, right? So I can do two things. So I can detect it and uh, block the download of the file here. But for some reason, if this is already um, infected, somebody put an USB stick or whatnot, right? And if I detect there is a malware, um, uh, there's, a, there's a UE which is malware infected and sending a lot of bad traffic. I can potentially block it on the edge point, right? So, so depending on the type of application, you can put firewall anywhere. Most of the time, in an evolved packet core, we have firewalls here right now. But now, with virtualization, it could be anywhere. It is, they call it ring around ring. So the firewall now doesn't have to be at a specific perimeter. So it, it is, it can be anywhere. So it doesn't also. require any dedicated hardware? So, wait, so, Oh yeah, we, you need a hardware. What I'm trying to say is, you don't need a, uh, a vendor-specific hardware, right? Okay. You still need to run it on a operating system, you know, which has some CPU memory and all those, right? Um, so if you go to look go to the previous page, you still need a hardware, right? This is you still need a hardware, but you don't need all these different kind of hardware. You need a common common hardware. Right? So. I will uh, spend some time because uh, what, what is threat and uh, then I'll see virtualization, right? So if you look at this network, this is the Evo packet code and uh, these are my network components. So when you set threats today, the reason I'm showing it because we have to see what are the threats today in a non-virtualized world. Then when you move to virtualized world, what are the additional threats you have to support? Right? So that's what I'm trying to say. So, so it's better to understand what are the threats today. So if I have a user going to the internet, so I have an internet facing elements, um, I have EnoD which is my you know, towers, um, I have Wi-Fi also, you know, sometimes you switch back to Wi-Fi when you go to hotspot, right? You may be still using the core network. So you may have uh, DOS denial of service attack coming from the user endpoint. It could be on the RAN, which is the radio access network here, right? Somebody can modify data. Somebody can do man in the middle attack. Uh, you can snoop that data traffic and modify that. Uh, if this is the signaling part. Um, anybody can snoop this traffic. Um, then you have attack from the other, other mobile operators like roaming. Nowadays, there are a lot of uh, those things happening in SS7, for example. Uh, one can have a man in the, uh, insider attacks like data leakage. Somehow you get access to HSS and things like that and change the uh, configuration. And many attacks today taking place. See, these attacks from the subscribers are in the rise, but it's not there yet. With 5G, with massive IoT, you will see lots of attacks coming from the subscribers, right? The dying attack that happened, that actually came from the IoT device that started sending a lot of queries. But most of the attacks today, I was having a discussion with my colleague that they are coming from the from the internet side, right? So internet tries to attack some of these elements. So then you need to have some sort of a firewall here. Okay. So if you if you look at the taxonomy, this kind of shows um, 
um, different kinds of threads. So you show there are many interfaces, and there are about 13 interfaces in, uh, in, in your packet code. So you can call a specific interface uh, on the signaling plane on data plane. <coughs> um, you can class, you know, I don't know, someone who might have tried it, you know, we tried it in our lab. Um, you, can, you can class a network element by sending a malform packet, right? And buffer overflow happens. So the whole network process, I tried that in our lab with, with HSS. So in that situation, if you, if you want to protect that, you need to have a good way to detect that there is a malform packet coming up, right? Uh, if stop, data leakage, uh, traffic modification, uh, I think I talked some of those. Um, are these attacks traceable to what we call fundamental vulnerabilities or not? Are these attacks traceable to? To fundamental vulnerabilities of components or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they are all software driven. Th th that is true. Um, so, so in software we know mm -hmm. what people typically explore, and you mentioned back overflow. If I do my software and I use this compiler that they say this, mm -hmm. then I, you cannot attack it. That is correct. So nobody does it. That's another story. But so really, are, are, are these are the only ones you have to worry about? So, so software, um, so there are things like uh, man in the middle attack, uh, it happens. So you really don't right. depend on the software. Right, right. right. So sometimes what happens is there may be a bug in the software that is different than I can use. Uh, Actual protocol fudging. Yeah, I mean, I can use. I mean, there's a there's a nice uh, tool you can use. You pass the protocol and just send multiple packets. So, so that that situation, uh, uh, my software may be fine, but attacker is doing some fudging stuff. Right? <laughs> that that case, you need to be able to detect that. Right? Uh, I just thought I you know give some example because this applies also to a virtualized network. So this is for the evil packet code. And and same thing, uh, what I'm showing you is an IMS network, IP multimedia subsystem, right? So you see this uh, voice over IP, nowadays people call, they call it SIP best DDoS, telephony DOS attack, right? You keep getting a lot of calls. The same thing might happen for voice over IP. Somebody uh, would be calling a lot of times, somebody may be just trying to register. Uh, so in that situation, there are protocols like SIP and RTP, those are the protocols people use for signaling and media for support voice over IP, right? Um, so in that situation, for example, here, uh, the, a, a bad guy uh, might be calling somebody else um, multiple times, right? Um, uh, so that's like more like unsolicited voice call, right? The voice spam, DDoS. Um, so how do I detect that? Obviously, it's a different kind of protocol, right? So I need to have a detection mechanism uh, when this guy is sending a lot of bad calls and it's affecting my server side session border controller, how do we detect what I detect and how do I stop it, right? Uh, so same thing, you can RTP malform, right? You can uh, malform the RTP packet and you can put something else. Somebody's telling something, you put something else and you change the whole uh, packet type, right? right? Uh, so this is on the voice over IP. And then same thing might happen on the RAM network. And with, so I, I, I talked about evil packet code, IP multimedia subsystem, which is for voice over IP, and then uh, radio access network. And this will become more and more um, vulnerable as we move to 5G, because we are going to virtualize the, the RAM, right? So then we have more vulnerability because it's all software based. And somebody has access to hypervisor, can go and change things around and do some kind of a backdoor uh, entry and snoop somebody else's packet right on in OB. So those are uh, things we have to think about. That means that situation we have to have monitoring and then right on the in OB. Okay. So with that, let me see what are the uh, what are the problems, opportunities, uh, and challenges. So this slide talks about uh, some of the opportunities. Uh, or benefits we have when you move to virtualization. So, so we still have to worry about those traditional threats. But on the on the left side, what it shows is uh, the the benefits of a software-defined NFT network. On the right side, it shows what are the benefits of security from the security point of view. So you have uh, your network network is simplified, automated. That helps you to automatically quarantine a specific VM. Let's say. Uh, it's tainted, right? And instead of getting the whole system down, while this thing
thing is getting quarantined or, or taken care of, you can stand it another PM. Um, you have a consistent policy configuration because of the whole software best approach. You can program things consistently and apply the policy all over the network. Right? Uh, flexibility scalability. Uh, here you saw the network is flexible and scalable. How it helps the security aspect. Um, for example, you know I call it DDoS resiliency. Uh, if you, I gave an example of stadium, which is a real scenario. But some let's say there is a botnet uh, malware infected, right? And you may not know that your uh, device is infected with a malware, right? It might be sending a lot of attach requests. You may not even know that. So in that situation, if your mobility management entity is overwhelmed, you can detect it. You can instantiate multiple MMEs, so you are resilient to the attack, but you still have to fix it, right? But you are resilient to the attack, so a DDoS effect is minimized. Block read out malicious traffic. So we'll give an example of that, but you have the ability to dynamically detect a malicious traffic going to uh, some enterprise and read out it. Um, you know using the detection. Um, single point of failure, security function, security as a service, multi-vendor implementation. You are not stuck with a specific vendor for a specific service, right? You can mix and match. Um, so next one, so that was the benefit part, right? I'm just giving a snapshot of some of the well, challenges. You know that it's also you bring in. So you say security function virtualization. So what I've seen for instance in CPL mm -hmm. you can only guarantee that different security functions are composed of Separate security function are not composable. Well, I have several, several security software and they try to, to attack, to, to, to defend against certain things. But when you compose them, mm -hmm. you have to get more, more. Right, I think when I. So, how do you do that? So, when I said security function virtualization, I was meaning more like, um, I I'm, I'm understand your question, but what I was meaning here is if you want to have DDoS as a security function. Yeah. IDS as a security function, IPS as a security function, or firewall as a security function, right? That's you're virtualizing those. You're service chaining them as and when needed. I think that's what I was pointing to. But maybe you have a point. But you can distribute this these ideas, you cannot guarantee that they will function correctly. Unless you have composed other UPI. Okay, so, so I mean here in the city we had a lab where we actually look at different software, contact software. We put them together and then it was easy to attack them through the interface. Because they were not done Okay, so I think your question is if those functions are also attacked. I think that is your question. I think, okay, okay. So what I am telling is how you deploy this as a modular function. I think that's different than what you're telling. You, your virtual firewall could be attacked. I think that's what maybe you are doing. Even if you have security functions which are modules, then you put a nano module is trying to detect this one, the other is trying to detect this one, you put them together. Okay? Right, right. Is the composition more secure? Um, at is, least, is it secure? At least there's the user components in the that? So, I mean, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, you need to you need to protect the components that su is helping us to protect. So right? For instance, there was two years ago there was the, the international hackers uh, conference. Which, which be careful when you go there, right? Because there is people are following you, right? I mean, FBI, etc. So, but they broke into this. It was a test, right? And they said to several CEOs, uh, "Do whatever you want on your phone, protect it." They gave several functions, and then the competition was who can break this into the phone. Okay. And they broke. There was uh, people from Santa Barbara, the, 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 the security people. They broke into two hours, and then they wrote an article about it. And the attack was actually in the case. Some the software was here. It was not neutralized. Yes, I mean, it's an example where you have to be careful. So they broke into the actual uh, whatever. They took full control of the phone. Right, right, right. But did they have any any mitigation or detection mechanism on the phone? They or called the executives, the three telecommunication companies. They do best you do the best you can for your iPhones. Because this is going to break into ours. So that's, I think, very fair. So I think your point is an important one where. Um, you know, I, I know have looked into a little bit how to protect the elements that are protecting the network, right? Because your virtual firewall is attacked. Well, this NSA project was, uh, they had to be a lab outside so they can work with companies. They said to different vendors. Mm -hmm. and of course, this is not virtualized completely. But I said to all the companies that you mentioned, bring us software you think they're going to do something. And they can, they, they have a function in this network that we have, which is 
partly wired and partly wireless. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then they had red teams and white teams. And then it could yeah. Yeah. So yeah. blue team, sorry. Yeah. And, and the way they could prove that the composition was composed of this, the red team could not break. Not, they could not do nothing else. But they were able to break the, the combined stuff. Okay. There is one so is that, is that, of course, this was partly due to the fact that they had different vectors and you don't have to work with your right, but they had some parts with your right. So it, it's not going to go away just because you do your right. No, no, you're right. I think uh, that is a way to. So, I mean, we work with a company called Gardicor, um, it's a wireless company, and uh, this was the same thing. What they did, you know, the Honeypot test solution, they put them in a different cloud completely. Uh, so, yeah, you, the, you, you mentioned Honeypot. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's another question, but we can go on and ask you. Because there are a lot of Honeypots here. Yeah, I mean, there's an example I'll show you around the test. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, okay, so let me go forward. So, now we talked about some benefits. There are some, but additional challenges that you have to think about, right? So now that we're introducing a component called Hypervisor, which manages all the virtual machines, uh, so Hypervisor is attacked, and uh, obviously the VMs uh, are under attack, and then you can get a lot of data out from the VM. So one VM is corrupted, it can do some kind of side channel attack to other VM. Uh, we are including a new component like orchestration, right? So which manages all the VMs. So like orchestration, when I'm giving a command, uh, I need to make sure that it's protected um, and all the automated configuration. Yeah. Because the orchestrator can be attacked. That's right. That, yeah, yeah. Orchestrator can be attacked. Orchestrator trying to orchestrate something. That can be also uh, vulnerable, right? And then SDN controller you are uh, adding. So SDN controller is a piece that will go and uh, configure the routers, getting the command from the orchestrator. So you have a northbound API, southbound API, they may be under attack, and how to protect the SDN controller. Um, then the last one I'm showing here example was uh, amplification attack due to elasticity. That means, uh, admitted, you have, let's say, DNS server, DNS attack, and then DNS amplification attack, right? So, so ha happily orchestrator will see that DNS server is under attack, and he will instance in more DNS servers, but it's an amplification attack, then it gets amplified again, right? So that means you need to control the, the DNS attack right away, right? So. Can I do the following, right? Sure. So there's a lot of research going on on dynamic uh, security boundaries or something like that, or, or the targets that are right? Mm -hmm. So dynamic security uh, that target uh, from the security from the user, this is where you can be attacked. Can I actually use SDM to completely change this language so that you can find it? So that uh, even if you know where you can attack me, I move around. Uh, oh, I see. By programming, so I can make it very different. Uh, I see. So you you kind of changing your your location availability. This is an extension of the idea that I have a program, and, and then when I actually run it or compile it, I compile it in random in different ways, and you cannot attack it the way that you know you can attack it. This is actually the way the program was done. But they proved that it's good and it was very expensive. So if you have programmability at the network, can I change it in random so that so, are you talking about your changing your IP address, things like that, so that I... All the components you say, I relocate, <laughs> and change them around, so you have a hard time. Okay, okay. So, so you basically relocate, right? Uh, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you see attack is happening, you just... Of course, I won't do the reset one, but I'll do it yeah, 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 yeah. the time, and then you think you can attack... That's a good, 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 good suggestion, yeah, yeah, I think... Uh, so, I mean, we're talking about VNF relocation, in case of failure, right? When you see this VNF is under attack, immediately, you know, what about do some load balancing. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that, that's, that's possible. Um, so moving forward, um, I'll, I'll kind of uh, give some examples now. So, um, so you got an idea about the traits, uh, some benefits, and this is again a summing up uh, some of the benefits and advantages uh, here. So, you have uh, centralized control function, security embedded at the design time. Uh, you're not limited only on the perimeters, right? You can move it around, uh, multi-vendor. Um, then you, you also increase the performance, right? Um, the real time capabilities, um, all those, right? So these are the additional, some of the benefits summing up. Uh, similarly, um, what I'm showing here is some of the challenges, okay? Um, so the SCNLB security expert group, um, the real diagram, what you see there is uh, there are traditional networking uh, threats, and there are virtualization cloud specific threats, right? When you 
get to an MP of this layer there, there's a, I don't know, the overlap there, at the same time, I to Pi for example, provides introspection. So, so there are some inherent capabilities hyperledger has that will help you to mitigate, right? But again, this is from a problem statement uh, document in HCNFD, which is a very important thing. Um, what I, I mentioned some of those, but there are also some of the low layers. Okay. Yeah. So, but, so I can do hypervisor for some to emulate some hardware specific events. Okay. Right. But I can show you simple examples where the security you provide by the hypervisor is nowhere near the one provided by the hardware. Security, yeah. So yeah. I basically, let's think about VPN. I have VPN, right? That's right. So you have a provider with it. Mm -hmm. And now you have hypervised implementation of VPN. Right. Well, it's not the same now. Because the technology to attack the hypervisor with software is much weaker, much easier than attacking the hardware. I mean, again, Intel is coming so up is, with... Is that, is that an issue or not? In other words, what I'm trying to say is a big question. When I try to attack the hardware, if I have hardened hardware, mm -hmm. I understand that these are special rights and they are more expensive. But if I have that, now for you to break into that, A, you have to have the hardware in possession, B, the technological competence you need is much harder than if you attack software. Is that an issue or not? I see. So you, you're trying to see... I mean, uh, uh, so you, so hyperpiger itself adds some uh, issues, but are you suggesting if you don't have a hyperpiger, it is... No, 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 so this is it's a very simple problem. Mm -hmm. We had this discussion within the CRTS, from two years ago. Mm -hmm. we, we were trying to figure out if there was a hardware-based security. Mm -hmm. hardware. okay, so well, it's a hardware, you like TPM stuff? TPM mm -hmm. and another three that you know the hardware, right? right. Like parts and all right. that stuff, right? right? So you can take all this and then you lay them on software. Right? Okay, okay. The TPM, you can actually do that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So the question was very complete. If you take a TPM with mobile phone and you take a TPM with a hypervisor here, right? Can you compare them from a security point of view? So when you say software, are you talking about virtual TPM? The Intel is building the virtual TPM, sir. Okay. We are experimenting with virtual TPM in there. Exactly, this question. The question is the difference. Is the, the virtualized TPM? or the form of the virtualized VPN as secure as the actual VPN? Yes. And my answer is no way. That is no correct. way. Yeah. I mean, it adds flexibility, but you're right. It took, uh, it took a Chinese guy about six months after obtaining the VPN to break it in the lab. The hardware VPN. Yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. So virtual TPM is something with Intel we have a collaboration with. We're trying that. I mean, I haven't, but this is a good a good thing to debate, right? <laughs> Uh, we'll see how that, that works. Uh, but, yeah, that's is this is a domain for programmer for one analysis or for one I mean, static analysis and think like that to verify that the uh, programs is... Uh, Actually, you know, so at this point, it's there is not even a systematic way to do this comparison. People basically say, okay, take it or break it or take it or break it. I can tell you that the hardware guy, at least at this stage of development, will take six times the time that will break the software. I give you the uh, right. I think from the deployment point of view, root of trust and virtual DPM is easy. So I, but I, I understand that this is a very simple problem, but, but yet it's a basic question. Right. I, I have to... Because fundamentally I believe in these decision systems, doing everything by software, you don't ask why I believe it, because I believe in God also. Okay? It's, it's not as secure as if you have some hard nodes. Right. Um, yeah, you're right. So I mean, the security can be that proof, but uh, provided that the software is not too big, you can do the, I mean, the people from former method do something wrong. Well, this is exactly the debate. Exactly. Thank you for yeah. mentioning. Because DARPA started the program uh, under NC's company, Kathleen uh, Fisher, right? on former methods for security. Okay? And I had big technical arguments that you can, and, and they want to include stacks, net, and all kinds of stuff, and not just this, okay? And I said, you are not going to be able to make the progress if you don't allow some hardware pieces, okay? Well, they, did not allow, they did not allow it, and the result was that the results were not extremely good. Okay? So we didn't just stop them on. No, no, I, I, I let you know a little bit. With hardened software, you have no control on the boundaries of software. No, you do. Oh, no, 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 that's right. That's what you know. And therefore, the, you may become vulnerable at the boundary. Yes, that's what hardware you do know about Okay? And the other thing with hardware is that I now have an uncle. Right? Because we, we, yep. we, we had a big project in Wireless. Yeah, yeah. 
and we prove that with, without the traffic core, yeah. you could not actually have security in the system which are very distributed. You should have somebody who say, I trust this more than that and I can use it, okay? Right. Anyway, I, I'm not, I don't have the answer. I'm just saying this is a very interesting question and I cannot answer. So, so I mean, right now what we are deploying, everything has a TPM. You know, that's by default, right? Because at least we have to make sure the hardware is protected. The virtual TPM, we haven't done that, but we are looking at you are, And you are sure that the managers of the network that you deploy know that you have a TPM? That's another question. Oh, yeah. We are, I, I think that is the first thing we make sure. You want to do a test? What is your son? Ask the IT people here if they know that 33% of the computers have TPMs. The answer is no, they don't know. Oh, yeah. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Point, point nine. Okay. Sorry. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah. So, this is the other aspect. You deploy this, and then who is managing it? You or the local managers? And are the local managers educated enough to work? This is that one, one aspect of the human factor. That is true. Education. Well, that's, that's another thing. Yeah. I mean, we are all getting trained in now. So <laughs> I'll probably get that up soon. But so 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 what I was trying to say is, uh, if you look at this diagram, there are different colors, right? So there are existing threats. Some of them I talked about. There are new threats due to virtualization, and there are also opportunities, right? So so when you are designing a virtualized network, you have to keep in mind those things. Don't forget the existing threats. You still have to think about it. And the additional threats like hypervisor, orchestration. Um, so sorry. For in the yeah. previous comment, you meant that if you have hardware, uh, hardware hardened, uh, what's called the common components, like if your computer is hardened, right. they won't be used right. by, let's say, PPM, mm -hmm. if that's the case with all the common hardware you're using, then you can actually do better. Is that what um, you know, I, if, I, you go, if you go If you go and harden your common computer hardware you're using, then you're better off to do this. I agree with that. Right, 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 right. But the virtual TPM part we are still investigating. But one thing though, I like to debate it a little bit. So if TPM takes care of good up trust and the whole booting process, but after that you still have a high provider. That's a separate question. Yeah. So the question is if every if every computer you use is TPM protected, is this contract? Of course the answer is of course it's contributing to the software defined network security. Uh, it, it is helping, definitely, right? Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think the whole idea, people are Intel, yeah. people are doing virtual TPM, so it becomes easy to deploy and things. But there is a whole trap and attestation, and you know, this whole attestation part, right? Attestation is important. Um, okay, so so this is again, you know, um, I, I just wanted to show that the opportunities that are, uh, um, you know, these are existing stuff, right? Um, I think I know I'm getting out of time, but I just quickly go through some slides. Um, so I just some use cases, right? So this this is a use case. Uh, again, this is the opportunity. Uh, I explained that. So you have um, uh, endpoints attacking. Um, somehow they got botnet uh, infected, uh, malware infected through botnet, and they're attacking, um, sending a lot of attached requests on the MME. So your orchestration somehow gets to know that the MME is overloaded and uh, it instances additional MME, right? So here, this is a DDoS attack resilience example of that, right? Uh, so, so while you figure out who is attacking it, you uh, instance at multiple things on the fly, right? So it reduces the time, uh, the resilience is there. So this is an opportunity. Um, this is a vulnerability. Uh, I talked about hypervisor, right? So your hypervisor, so PPM is somewhere on the hardware, right? But on the top of that, you have hypervisor. Um, a hypervisor is attacked, then it's almost like a root user, right? Think about that way. So you you may have different tenants. Uh, you may be hosting, uh, you know, tenant one, tenant two, and you don't want if this VM is attacked, should not be affecting the other VM, uh, should not be stealing the resources from other VM. Uh, so it's, it's, this is a very important issue now. For us, at least, uh, how to make sure uh, monitor the hypervisor, and if it is being attacked, how to guarantee the VMs? Uh, because eventually, what happens is data get exfiltrated from one VM, other VMs, and then you know, that is so starving. Um, we are talking to Intel uh, to see whether they have anything right now. Uh, we have a problem. Uh, we have internet facing application, internet sensitive, non sensitive application. For now, we are separating them. We are not putting them on the same right? So, but that is a very simple way of doing it until we have some solution to detect uh, and, and 
very good time, right? So that is a challenge, important challenge. Um, this is another opportunity where uh, I'm, I talked about SDM controller, right? In the data plane, if uh, the users are sending some bad traffic or malicious traffic, uh, you have to have some kind of a service abstraction layer like a deep probe that detects that, and then uh, it communicates with SDM controller, and then it uses uh, this dynamic, whatever the, uh, the rule, configuration rule, to configure this firewall, which is a virtual firewall, on the fly. So your uh, bad traffic gets either stopped or gets rerouted, rerouted to a scrubbing center where it gets scrubbed further and analyzed further, right? So you're in that process, you are protecting our, uh, protecting our customers. Right, that's not going to work on it. You cannot protect that a, an attack on a power grid will start an attack on You're never going to get it. Yeah. That's so when, when now people start attacking the control algorithms and the inference algorithms and the virus, it's called the cyber physical systems to be like power grid or communicated values and so forth. What they do is they give you the attack is a command. It's a thing that says find this kind of hardware in the end device that runs this type of algorithm and change this. And what they try to do is not loop attack, it's not network attack, it's something else. It's trying to, to make the controller to give some command to the physical part, but the physical part cannot sustain. Uh, okay. So what you can do in the power grid is you can give commands for the wind turbines or the photovoltaics to operate. So it's a control algorithm you are attacking. And, uh, and that, this whole system is not designed for that. So how do we do that? So when you say that... If I the communication network now, how, do I can, how can I use the virtualized network uh, to actually... I have to add a component, right? I have to add something that is in the interface at the so, moment. Okay, maybe I'll just say I switch to this topic. So what you're telling is that this SDM controller, right? You, this this API can be attached. Is that what you're telling? I mean, yes. because there are, yes. there are yes. so this is what I was yesterday. I think briefly mentioned that, right? Um, so this what I'm showing here is an example of where SDM controller may be misconfigured. And this actually happened, and somebody got into this and tried to mess around. Right. Uh, but what you're telling is I can have man in the middle attack on this control elements also, right? So so for that, the company I mentioned, Ivan SDN, they have some way of detecting that, but, but this, is a, this is an issue. So, so it's not only configuration part, but um, and, and you know, it could be in one part of the also. Right. Yeah. In different kind of attack, the time, the attack in other functionality is something that's at the low end, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll, somehow, in some cases, the other. That's true. Yeah, um, okay, yeah, I mean, I've, that's a good point. Um, so so the, the other one was this that DNS kind I was talking about. I see, I showed previously from the attack from this side, then there could be attack from the uh, from the internet side, right? So somebody, and this is happening on network, uh, within a DNT network using another DNS resolver, our virtual DNS was under attack. Of course, if you have this environment, yeah. program, say you succeed and everything is nice, mm -hmm. then attacking the program and describing, it's going to be easy. For example, in a program, you can add it. So it can prevent this attack. And that's easy to, to do in a program, network, and a part of it. Because then you have to go to every device and add something. So there is, there is, this is the promise, but I have not been able to... So you make it distributed and bring it closer to the yeah. uh, victim, right? Yeah, so, so if, you, if, you, if you go through and find out how they were able to find out the stacks in the attack, and what, what was the attack, and what it was targeting, you can mimic this, you can write a script that mimics what the human did, and then one part of that could be an addition to this, and then that's right, 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 right. And when you find it, you block it out, you don't allow it. That's Especially if you have yeah, TPM and every device, you can do that. Yeah, let me think about that, the stuff's never been in this input for that. Um, now, but this is very important because I think you guys are working on infrastructure security. Hey. And now, let me scale We know. We know. So there is a way to attack all infrastructures and run them for a minute of time. We know that. It's important. So when you... In other words, there's a, there's a, already we know there's an extension of Stuxnet mm -hmm. which can attack almost all infrastructures you have which rely on the communication networks. Okay? That's why you see the, 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 
representatives from the government and the agencies, what do we do to protect the infrastructure? This is the big thing. Now, it has not happened, we do not know why it has not happened. So I think the question is, can the software-based solution will help us to... I think it can, but it has to have this additional thing. It's not communication network on Skype. It's more like I'm trying now to, to have the functionality of the infrastructure which is benefiting from the So I'm thinking, you know, this is something we're trying, and we call it Astra. So it is open stack, similar to open stack as firewall, right? Where you put the firewall around the, around the infrastructure, and it could be, depending on the role of the component, you can have various kinds of uh, firewalls around it, right? So if you don't have it in the middle of the network the firewall, you just move it to the end. And then, uh, depending on the kind of attack, uh, you know, we call it security orchestrator from Astra, that's our role of the component. You go and put the rules on those, uh, you know, it's like a distributed firewall in some way, right? Very nice. But suppose I find from what I know about the network, mm -hmm. where in the edge are the new computers that this particular attack that you're trying to attack. Right. And I could do something and say, no, you're not going to do it. I'm not going to allow you to right. attack right. in the last right. edge. Right. 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 But that's the end communication that is the thing. Okay. That's the thought. Uh, no, 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 that's good. Uh, so I'll give some, some more example. Maybe. Uh, so this is an example of we did in our network uh, uh, where the first example, the UV was going to a malicious URL. And here we uh, detect that uh, using the virtual IDS. You know, just, uh, and then communicate those. Uh, so we detect that, then analyze. Um, the UV's IP address in CL and MEI, then pass it on to uh, other policy rule functions, then finally policy enforcement, and then um, we block we block this uh, uh, UV from going to a specific URL, right? So this is a, uh, and it happens within you know seconds, right? So we just immediately, so you don't have to wait for it. Um, the second uh, example was, so you cannot access this URL anymore, but you can access other URLs, right? Um, the second example was uh, malware detection. The UV was downloading a document, it's malware infected, and then we have uh, this IDS had some uh, signature test. So you detect that this, this doc, what document has malware, um, then uh, it does the same thing, and finally uh, we use, you know, this is one example of how to stop it. So the, that, that specific document is, cannot be downloaded up. If for some reason this is downloaded, then other at least one guy is infected, but it stops others from getting infected, right? Uh, just another example. Uh, the third example is, uh, so, so UE is blocked from accessing the internet except for emergency call, right? So you can make it granular. Right? The third example is uh, overload control. Uh, again, not going into net neutrality here. You, one UE is supposed to have certain bandwidth, and you can detect an application and bandwidth associated. Let's say it's doing some streaming supposed to be 100 uh, kilobit, but went over so 1 megabit per second. Uh, you detect that, and you can, uh, you know, depending on what you want to do, is stop it or not. Like that's just another way of different application of detect, detection, and mitigation, or uh, things like that, right? So this is, we call it closed loop control, right? And um, how quickly you dynamically detect and mitigate. Um, these two slides, uh, again, since I talked about 5G yesterday, we had a big discussion, so I was just wanted to show this. Uh, again, this is only on the RAN side, and the example here is, uh, uh, if you have lots of IoT devices and you have a, a CRAN, the cloud RAN here, right? Um, and this could be uh, uh, under attack, right? Uh, in this, this case, uh, uh, it can overload the RAN resources. Uh, so FCC, uh, we just contributed something. FCC was very much worried about this whole 5G related stuff, and they have a cybersecurity document. And they, were, they have some recommendations in situations like this. What should we do, right? So traditionally, um, we do not have any detection monitoring event in the in the you know, beach. Now, Some companies have maybe Huawei has it. Uh, so we need to put more detection functions uh, in the cloud rack, right? Uh, so. Uh, so when you 
scale up, at the same time you should be able to uh, detect also what's happening. Uh, what to detect and how you contain So, yeah, yeah. So, so I think you know, I have some idea. I think it becomes pretty good easier because if you think about actual implementation, uh, your, uh, your S1U, uh, the tunneling happens here, right? So before it is tunnel, if you have access to the data, you can, you can do that, right? <laughs> I mean, basically you're doing some DPI uh, stuff here, right? Uh, the next one is again uh, compromised resources. This is similar to the high provider, right? If you have multiple uh, providers that collaborate on the same brand, right? So this is another uh, interesting uh, challenge. Uh, so it's similar to high provider, but moving the problem to edge, right? Uh, um, I know I I think we have slides, but I wanted to show some of the provider stuff. But here I'm showing um, some data center specific cloud threats. And uh, there are slides you can take a look. Uh, each of them explains what it is. But in, in a nutshell, I'm showing here is um, you can have threats from one VM to another VM, one application affecting a VM. Uh, it could be coming from a remote management path. The VMs within the same data center. Yeah. yeah. So 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 this is here the same data center, same hypervisor, right? This is the same hypervisor. Uh, so one VM, uh, one VM application attacking another VM. It could be host application, which is not under VM. It could be like a standard host, like let's say DNS, right? Uh, could be affecting uh, the VM. Uh, the attack might be coming from a uh, element management system, network management system. Uh, uh, could be from ISP. Uh, could be from another PC too. I mean, I have I have explanation of each of those here. Like, uh, what are the threats? Uh, attack to the same domain, attack to the host, uh, so and so forth, right? And then, uh, what I appear in another example, uh, so this is, I'm just giving you an example of when you have to think about your threat taxonomy, you think about what is the attack, then how do you mitigate, right? Um, so this is just an example of a hypervisor uh, compromise, right? If this happens, what are the mitigation techniques we have to think about, right? And some cases, some are easy, some are complex. In some cases, you may not have anything. We just think, well, I wish Intel has something to um, take care of that, right? Um, the interventions of this limited, more conservative device, the device IoT protocol, is a claim that's designed to protect the security. You mean, you mean Intel types? No, no, no. This is from, this is a little bit of a policy pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, device to device, or device to some. Yeah. 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 Ye
Um, so as you see here, I know, just to this software security model, right? That's where the SDN controller, hypervisor, orchestration, uh, identity access management. I didn't talk about it. This is a very important piece. Uh, security function virtualization, industry engagement, more like standards, right? Um, so we are very much into open source. Uh, ADNT is an embraced open source community. Uh, there are challenges there, uh, but you know, university has been an interesting way to collaborate and contribute there also. Um, so we are running open source labs, uh, open stack open source labs to try all those. And these are some of the open source community um, who are working on it. Um, so this is the test bed I, I think showed to some of you. Again, it's a very high level thing. What I'm showing here is as a multi vendor environment, uh, we have different types of people back at four from different vendors. Um, they have an emulation environment. We can try to generate different kind of traffic, manual, uh, signaling traffic, um, data traffic. We have a real um, uh, enodes, like a small uh, uh, caviar enodes and big enodes. So we really, basically we build a whole EPC or multi network in all that, like a playground. It's like a playground to play around, do different security stuff. And uh, then I talked about security function virtualization, right? So this is able to do the service chaining, DDoS, IDS, firewall, and then uh, the orchestrator, SDN controller. You know, I'm just showing them how we tie them together. In one instance, what we did, uh, we set up a, in the Amazon cloud, we set up an EPC, we just uh, virtual EPC. We set up another virtual EPC in our lab, and within like a minute. We instantiate the virtual EPC, we set up a call, one in Amazon EPC and the other one using uh, so EPC to EPC call. Just, just to actually, I'll, I'll give you the, the video there. I can, uh, who, who is doing the emulator? So this is the Ixia uh, record point. Uh, this is what I was telling you, right? So uh, it's actually an emulator. Uh, it is an emulator. And it can integrate with the real oh, EPC. Um, I think university probably will get much better price. We pay like about, no, we pay about 40,000. Uh, but I'm sure they must have a good price for university. Uh, hardware is more expensive. They recently come up with a software version. So, and then we have the virtual IMS. Um, so the, the honeypot thing I was telling uh, Professor Baras was, this one, this is from Gardicor. Um, there's something called east-west traffic, there's the north-south traffic. So east-west means, you know, you have in the same data center VM to VM. Um, so this is where uh, we... The honey pot, uh, okay, what kind of honey pot? Is it, is it trying to collect data? Or are you trying to leak some of the protection to see if you're going to be attacked also? Now, are you trying to find out where you get some of the behavior of the attacker? Or behavior of the attacker. You are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, actually, in this case, it, it, it forwards. Attacker doesn't know that his, uh, his data is getting uh, well, correct to the... Some attackers find this quickly. <laughs> No, I'm asking because we have a Mr. Pinky is not here. But we have a project in this university where our IT people working with our, our faculty, Mr. Pinky, to actually do very sophisticated kind of analysis. And from the simple view of trying to find data, all the way to the most sophisticated, you can I infer the intention of the attack. And then the idea that we are actually thinking now for a nice nice. Year's project was done in several people here. Is can I then exploit that intention and destroy the attack? So this is like almost playing a war game on the on this thing, right? So if you, if you will decoy it, I can try to use your intention to try to give you something that I want you to attack and say it's not the real thing, and then I can I can So he, okay, so he, this guy hasn't really attacked, but based on the behavior, predictive behavior, so you can predict the intention and then you play a game. It's a very nice game theoretic compilation, but it's not the standard game. Because here you have, you have the attackers, which can be one or several, among many, and they can collaborate. You have the defenders, one or many, they can collaborate, and then you have the user. And the user play a big role, because the attack accepts, the attack succeeds or not, to a large degree, based on the behavior of the attack of the user. Mm. But they are not part of the thing. The, the, the use attacker, for instance, between the attacker and the defender, is one thing. But then in that attacker, you have to add the influence of the user. I mean, there are honeypot getting more and more popular now in the software test stuff. 
And then the other thing I want to show, uh, this is just to because you know, a little bit research, there is one uh, company called Connected. Now, Brocade bought them, right? Um, they have an interesting virtual EPC. They, they do everything through IPC, they're functional best. So they don't expose some of the interfaces, for example. Yeah. I mean, in this case, they expose this one U, this one AP, because S11, although they are leading, they make it very optimized. So the, the challenge is there, but uh, some, some of the 5G people are thinking nice. I mean, anyway. this test, this test by the heavy, for instance, can try to find out what is the concentrate of how much I explode to the antipod mm -hmm. before I can be detected that this is phony. And still collecting that information by the intention of the user, right? I can do experiments with this, right? And, and try to find out what the, the, the point point is going to be the antipod in such a way so that it cannot be easily detected and yet it gets to what I want to get. Right. So that's a very that's very useful something. Right. But the other thing I think you mentioned that before, right? Uh, if this is let's say the heart of this honeypot system where uh, all the traffic gets realized, how do you even protect this? Right? This is what you had mentioned before, right? So I mean because these data centers are already under attack, I have to somehow have some protection mechanism. So, so that we understand the state of affairs right now, this thing is that where the honeypot just things are viral. So they have not the analysis that we have in the method, the method cannot handle a few step traces of attack every time. We cannot do that. We just do things in the case of viruses. Okay, fine, but I mean, that, that's all how it's just the attack that we attack. They will try to find patterns, they will try to find, you know, all kinds of stuff. And then, and then what people do is they employ funny, uh, funny uh, fraud or funny uh, computers which behave like normal. But we know they're funny. Right. To try to make you zero on this one, and then, right, right, right. But then you get the data and you have to analyze it away. Otherwise, no, that's interesting. Which is very, this test has to be very useful. So, I agree. Yeah. I mean, the, this is all open stack, and this is the Astra one, which is like a security orchestrator, right? This is what mm -hmm. is done. Okay. So just to wrap up, so these are different standards bodies uh, working on, um, uh, and some of them are the operating systems, switch. Um, I'm very much involved in the XCNLB, personally in IT a little bit. Um, is it the controllers thing you can even pick? So there is a community for this open source stuff. I mean, most of Linux Foundation own most That's of what it. You say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a community. You're right. Um, uh, okay, there, there are some drafts. I'm running out of time, but uh, there, there, there are what 14 different drafts out there yeah. uh, for XCNLB. Um, so that comes up. Security war going on, just to let you know. Um, I'm, I'm very much involved in this one. There is a security trust guidance. I think some of the attestation thing also, like important attestation technology. So, this is the one um, you're talking about, like virtual TPM versus hardware TPM, right? So, there is a lot from that. A um, little bit about IEEE, because I'm IEEE volunteer. We have been doing a lot of this 5G stuff, um, you know, got about 10 or 11 of those. Uh, maybe someday we'll do it in Washington DC, or maybe in Maryland University. Um, uh, we just come here with that. Uh, all, if you go to 5G uh, submit.org, you'll find a lot of slides uh, if you want to educate uh, yourself a little bit. Um, there are a lot of, uh, eco it's an ecosystem, a lot of stuff happening, the 5G is coming up. Uh, there are different standards for them, a uh, lot of research companies, universities, I know IBMD, some, some of the faculty are involved. Operators are trying to deploy 5G, but mostly on the brand side. All right, so this community is building up. Uh, within IEEE, as I said, uh, there are about 20 different, uh, uh, right now 12 societies uh, that got them together. We started this uh, workshop 29th, 30th of August at Princeton. So this is a new area. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funded project, so if you want to contribute, uh, depending on your area of interest. Um, this is how it is right now, it looks like there are several tracks, not only standards. Um, so education, publication, conferences, standards, right? And then uh, we have several projects, different working groups, like MIMO, uh, MAC group. Um, and in Globecom, some of you are attending, we have a roadmap workshop, I will send the information if you want to attend and continue. Yeah, please do, because yeah. Yeah, yeah, I will send that. Uh, right, right. And then obviously uh, there are 
publication with you know, journal and uh, magazines, uh, education like tutorials in between. Um, and yeah, well, I just this is to get involved because uh, Gerhard is uh, working with me very closely, and we have IEEE really support, staff support, but we need uh, community involvement. Um, you know, these are some of the technical areas, but if you have more technical areas to focus, uh, we have a security area also. You can propose that and you know be a chair, a fracture, or not, right? Uh, so it's very IEEE gives that freedom to university and industry research everybody. Right? It's not like UGPP where you have to be a paid member, right? Um, I guess that's kind of my last slide. So what I was uh, overall I was trying to say is uh, you know the emerging applications, uh, the driving force towards uh, moving the network, the virtualized network, starting with SDN and IP, building up on that, have 5G related uh, uh, network, right? And um, so SDN and IP obviously an enabler for 5G. Um, there are opportunities, there are challenges in the security. Uh, operators cannot do solve by themselves, so we need support from vendors, uh, university researchers, r and labs. And most importantly, as uh, I said, having a test bed is so important. Personally, uh, we have benefited a lot. Uh, we work, so far at least, personally I have worked with 30 different vendors um, doing the proof of concept, right, in that test bed. So this is a good way to lessons learned, right, and then uh, then we talk to the actual deployment folks. Uh, so they kind of act as a catalyst, proof of concept, aspect, standardization, and programming. That's kind of my, any questions, I'd be happy to answer. <laughs> <laughs>